friends is hard enough as it is, but making friends in the workplace brings a different set of complications. Now, studies show that healthy relationships on the job can improve your experience and your career opportunities. But what if you're not ready to be a social butterfly? Can the antisocial worker also thrive in the workplace, or is having friends the only way? Joining us in our Google Hangout to discuss, we have Miriam Saltpeter. She's an editor for AOL Jobs and a career coach in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Michael Hausman, he's the Vice President of Workforce Analytics at Evolve in San Francisco, California. Shola Richards, he's a corporate trainer and positivity consultant in Los Angeles, California. And Beth Rankin, he, she's the editor of Cat5 Magazine in Beaumont, Texas. Welcome, y'all. See, Beth's in Texas, so I feel like I can say y'all. Uh, but you know, y'all is the kind of kind of thing that you refer to with your friends as a casual statement. And not everyone is as into friends in the workplace as some of you on the panel. Not all of you on the panel are as into it either. Some of you agree with A-Dubs 1988. I tend to keep them separate. Work is for work, not for making friends. Not that I've been friendly with coworkers, but I don't put my personal life out there for everyone to see. We have this having them post piece why you should care about having friends at work. And actually, Dr. Hausman, we have here your blog piece, The Friendship Effect. It was actually written by your co-founder at Evolve, but you are the people who worked on the research that showed really interesting things about friendship in the workplace. You're actually muted. If you could go to your upper right hand corner and unmute yourself, that would be fan flippin' -tastic. There you go. I think we've got you now. Well, Miriam, you might not have done the study. While we're working on the doctor's, uh, doctor's audio, you completely understand. You're at our favorite place in the whole wide world, AOL Jobs, right here. And you do have nine ways to be happier at work. And friendship plays a huge part in it. Absolutely. I believe that one of the things that the studies show is that when people have some friends at work, they become more engaged and they're a little happier to be there. It's always nice to be going someplace where you feel like there's a friendly face. And while I don't think you need to, as I said in the post, you don't need to have besties at work. Not everyone needs to hear about the details and the intimate details of your lives. But it's nice to have someone who you can go to coffee with and maybe go to lunch. Well, again, here is that post so we can see AOL Jobs. Uh, you got right here nine ways to be happier at work. We also have this comment. My husband's always managed to not have many friends at work. He prefers to keep work and personal separate. Dr. Hausman, could this be affecting Rona's husband's career? You are still muted. We're going, we're going, we're going to work on that. But Shola, you're our positivity consultant, our friend. Tell me everything. Mm -hmm. How can being friendly, how can making friends at work uh, affect an individual? I think work and uh, the thing is we need to define what a friend means. And I think the reason why most people have challenges with the idea of making friends at work is because they think that it means you're going to go grab beers with a person. You need to tell them your innermost, deepest, darkest secrets. Let's just define friend as someone that you know, trust, like and respect if you define it that simply and also realize how many hours we spend at work with people don't you want to spend on average those 122,000 hours with people you know like and respect not only will it make it easier for you to get your job done make you more happy at work most importantly because you know i'm the happiness guy and also give you a feeling of self-worth and connection to the work that you're doing. I don't see any reason why you want to avoid doing that. Beth, your thoughts? Uh, I have a hard time defining trust in the workplace. I guess I sort of have a, a trust no one mentality. Uh, when I worked at a newspaper in Ohio, we were having a, a friendly, you know, happy hour drink session and somebody had mentioned, you know, when they had we, the, the cop that came up of casual drug use in the past and through, um, you know, the kind of he said, she said of a workplace environment, by the end of that next week, suddenly there were all these rampant rumors going to the newsroom. People were drug tested. It was a very iffy thing that came from a, a casual sort of happy hour conversation. And that, I think that's something that especially young people uh, coming into the workforce need to keep in mind and that, uh, 
you know, watch what you say when you're at happy hour, uh, because it's, it's hard, I think, to define who in a workplace you can trust and who you can't. Well, I, you know, Beth, I totally agree with that. And I think that that's something that happens on social media as well. People are confused about who is able to see what they're, what they're uh, sharing online, just as they might be a little confused about a social um, environment at work, and they might say some things that they would be less likely to say maybe if they were thinking more clearly or, you know, they weren't so open. So I definitely think that the idea of defining friendship as having a, a good relationship and someone who you can sit down with and have a nice casual conversation without necessarily sharing those intimate details. Well, Beth, that is an interesting aspect of this. Wait, did I hear? Did I hear the doctor get in here? Yeah, I think I think we got connected. So, I, I think there, there are a couple things to, to point out. Statistically, I think it, we've shown that friendship is actually a good thing. People who are referred by friends to a job stay ten to twenty percent longer than those that are not referred. And on top of which, um, I think someone just mentioned. Uh, online interactions. We've looked at social networking in the workplace, and uh, somewhat surprisingly, we found that it's a good thing that people who are socially networked, uh, that use a certain number of those networks, tend to be more productive. They provide better customer interactions. Uh, they're significantly better at sales and sales type work. And so, you know, the data tends to suggest that, that being friendly at work isn't just a positive in its own right, but that it actually promotes better workplace behaviors and performance. Miriam? I, I absolutely agree. In my own past experience, I have found that having some colleagues to rely on and knowing some people had my, had my back in a work environment was, was um, really something that made me feel more comfortable and happy to be at work. I think oftentimes we rely on our colleagues to do us a favor or to take a shift if we need a day off or we, we have something we need to take care of. And so I think that cultivating those kind of collegial bonds can be really important for someone who wants to be successful and climb that corporate ladder. Well, it is interesting. We have these comments here that are kind of agreeing from their personal experience. Brianna, one, uh, building friendships at work will only allow you to become more successful with your clients. Then we have Rion Barrett. I think I lost out on two promotions because I didn't hang out with my coworkers. Mm -hmm. Beth, that's just the worst. You, you, you expect in a fair world to be judged on the quality of your content and not on the number of your Facebook friends. Oh. Right, uh, you know, or at least to be judged on uh, on how funny you are. I, I, I'm just, uh, hmm, that's tough because I, I kind of purposely have uh, avoided some, let's say, holiday parties, for instance, uh, because I think there's a tendency to, um, shall we say, overindulge, particularly in journalism. And, uh, and not only do I not want to be the person to divulge information, I kind of don't want to see that. <laughs> I kind of want to, I like to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, I guess. We have a comment here from someone who actually delved into our resource well and read your wonderful piece right here. Hell is other people is the anti-social network. Having read the comments and the anti-social stance in the workplace on Beth Rankin's piece, I'm curious, Beth, you chose a field in which you interact publicly. If this is such an issue to you, why stay in that field? Well, I think more of what I was saying in my piece is not that I'm against relationships or people. It's that kind of nagging and recurrent small talk that happens. Elevators are the bane of my existence, uh, especially at my workplace, because you have these three to five minutes where you just have the most banal small talk with people. And what I was saying is, that, you know, I feel better when we elevate our conversations to the next level that sometimes I just can't have another conversation where you say, how are you? I'm good. How are you? And so I think it's good. I think it's good for people to sometimes step back and say, you know, maybe I need a, a social break where I, I can think about how to further my interactions with people beyond just elevator small talk. Well, and show no, Oh, yeah, please, I, go I, ahead. I, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting because I, 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 first of all, Beth, I admire your courage to come here with the three guys are really feeling the, the, the friendship vibe here. <laughs> well, I, but it's interesting, though, because, I mean, you talk about the small talk, the, hey, how you doing, you know, what's going on, and the color of your tie type of a thing. But 
we have to start conversations somehow. We have to make connections somehow. We can't just jump into a conversation and start mapping the human genome or trying to, you know, figure out how to split the atom. The way we make connections with people starts with a small talk and that builds from there. Every close friend that you have in your life probably started with that first conversation, that first piece of seemingly lame small talk that built into something bigger, but will never build into something bigger we shut down the small parts of it first. Well, but that's true, but, but it's interesting because Miriam, you have this great piece here on AOL Jobs, how talking politics at work can get you fired. And you're absolutely right. Every conversation starts somewhere with your friends, but every conversation can also start somewhere with your enemies. And, and in a workplace environment, when you're dependent on that paycheck, sometimes it might be better to cut your losses and to remain a little uh, standoffish and antisocial for fear that your politics don't jive with those around you. Right, you know, absolutely. One thing that some people may be surprised about is that in most states, over-expressing your political view can actually get you fired. You don't have a right to free speech at work. And this is, I think, a surprise for some people because other people might think that uh, constitutes a hostile work environment. So you need to be really aware of your environment and what you're saying. And it's absolutely a good point that sometimes it's best to smile and nod and not get involved in, uh, you know, too deep of a political conversation at work. And, and I actually want to make one more point that touches on something that Beth had said. So what we found is that this actually varies by industry and position type. So, so what we call the friendship effect is much stronger in fairly social types of roles like customer service representative and so on and so forth in call centers. When we look at things like long haul truckers or even software engineers, the effects are muted. So, so I do think there's some support to the notion that if you're not a social person, you, you might not be penalized if you're in an industry or a role where that isn't necessarily prerequisite. So, so it's not as if you're, you're necessarily doomed at the outset. And you know something else? I'm a big fan of using social media for pro professional use. And I think sometimes people who tend to dislike small talk, maybe they consider themselves introverted, maybe they're not engaging a lot with their colleagues at work in person, but they can look to social media to expand their network and engage online in a way that could be a little more comfortable and a little more distant, and yet they can still demonstrate their expertise and make contact with people who could potentially refer them for their next opportunity. That's a very interesting yeah, I mean, point I, I, because we have here JBKR 2009. I have past direct reports that I am friends with to this day. You also have people going to extremes remembering, uh, if I can just get my computer to work, W.T. Effington, the wonderful multifaceted W.T. Effington. Was it Friends <laughs> where the character took up smoking so she could socialize with her boss? And we don't, we don't condone going to those extremes just so you can be part of the party. But it is true. I mean, people can refer you if they want, if they enjoy working with you before they can bring you on with them you know I used to work with somebody who always seemed to know what was going on even more than our immediate boss knew and then it turned out that she was spending time with the boss's boss in the smoking lounge and so that definitely is a situation where her social engagement made her someone who was in the know at work yeah, and I would, I'd add, you know, to your point, a quarter to a third of people uh, get jobs via referrals. I was referred to my current job. One of my senior analysts got the job because we had a mutual friend. I mean, again, it's, it's, a, it's a valuable tool in addition to gathering information and being more socially connected and kind of getting a head start on what's going on in the workplace. That's a great you know, point. Those oh, no, go ahead. Go no, ahead. please, Shola. It's interesting because we were talking a little bit about leadership and uh, JBKR2009 made something about saying that the comment from one of the readers said that he's still friends with some of his direct reports to this day. And I know what's seemingly controversial to a lot of people is the idea of you can't be friends with your direct reports. If you're in a leadership role, you have to have this, this invisible leadership barrier around yourself to protect yourself at arm's length or else we cross these strange lines of favoritism and blurred lines between leadership and employee. And I've never really believed that. I've always believed that people 
always, always work harder for people who they like and respect. And if you really think about that, I mean, if we all are being honest with ourselves, you know, at least I can speak for myself, that I work my hardest for people whom I like and respect. And if you think about this, it's both like and respect. I mean, there's plenty of people. I've never heard someone say, dude, I really, really like this guy, but I, I don't respect him. But you probably could say, hey, I really respect this person, but I, I just don't like them. The I idea think, is to have both, like and respect. I think individual office dynamics play a lot into this. I work in a, a fairly typical office. You know, we could be a carbon copy of any office in the United States, but the staff of my magazine actually work outside the office. Uh, and when we meet, we meet up for happy hour. We have uh, our meetings over drinks and dinner, and it's much it's the much more social, informal atmosphere. And that's kind of how we build the magazine, which I publish sort of separately uh, of the newspaper. But that dynamic that we have, if they worked in the office with me, I don't think it would work the same way. So I think it's very dependent on how each office functions on its own. Beth, that's really interesting. We have a comment here from Tiffany HuffPost, the producer of this segment. I am one with Beth. We also have this comment with you <laughs> and uh, many others on this panel may be able to relate from Tesla's the new BMW. We have an employee who constantly, and I constantly mean, uses power language when referencing me. And I'm the gosh darn CFO. For me, this demonstrates an extreme insecurity in this person. I, I think that's one of the problems a lot of times bosses or upper management might face in dealing with being friends in the workplace because it's hard to be friends with someone where there's an important and, and direct hierarchy. Uh, that you do need to keep clean for business purposes when you muddy it with friendship. Absolutely. Uh, I agree. Although, what is power language? Yeah, I was, 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 was going to say the same thing. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, awesome. <laughs> or or you, can, you can imagine it, whereas this is someone who is you know, 15 years senior to you, and, and just because you had a cup sure. of coffee, you're like, you know, my butt over here when you're in the, when you're in the board meeting. I can, I can imagine that's not exactly helpful when you, when you yourself are trying to maintain ground as the boss of everyone, even individuals you might not be friends with. Uh, when you have someone referring to you in perhaps a maybe subconscious differential way, like my bud, my pal, my homie, this is not helpful when you're in a three-piece suit trying to lead a meeting. But yeah, my boss talking... likes it when I call him homie, personally. But... <laughs> <laughs> but are we talking about professionalism, though? I mean, if we're talking about an environment where professionalism reigns supreme, then you're not going around calling, hey, what's up, homie? What's up, Pop? Huh? <laughs> you're doing it a little bit different because you're in an office setting, right? And if you think about it, for the people who I lead in my office, my goal is I want to connect with them. I want them to realize that I care about them. I know the names of their kids. I know the vacations that they've gone on. I know what's going on in their lives. And it makes them want to feel like, all right, he gets me. He understands me. He wants to know me at a deeper level. Now, some people are like, whoa, 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 I'm not trying to do that. Work is for work, and personal is for personal. But I honestly believe that if I'm going to spend 122,000 hours on average at work, I keep throwing that number out there, I might as well be making connections with people who I care about. And I'm not just talking about friend to friend, coworker to coworker, that whole collegial bond. I'm talking about even from a leadership level on down because – we're together, we're in it for so much time. Why not make it count? I think Shola made a great point when he talks about thinking about those touch points that we can connect about that is beyond just, hey, how are you doing? You know, what's for breakfast? What about the weather? And instead, really d diving into what is important for that person you're trying to get to know a little bit. So maybe it's, um, you know, so we can, we can look at things that are, personal and yet not deeply personal. So we can talk about um, our vacations and not necessarily our relationships. We can talk about our children, but not necessarily, you know, our deep dark secrets about our spouse or our partner. So I think that in really looking at what are those touch points and what would people be interested in discussing is something that could really help people bond at work and be friendly, if not Friend, you know, having best friends. And Miriam, your point is so well taken because if you think about it, we all have different types of friends, right? There's, if you just got into a horrible fight with a significant other, there's a certain group of friends who you would call for comfort. 
that might be a different group of people that you would call than if you wanted to go out and get some drinks at the club later on at the night. So we all have friends for different things. And the same thing for at work, too. We have friends that we connect with at a certain level. We might not go into depth about our personal lives, what's going on with our, our lives, our wives, our husbands, or whatever. But it doesn't mean that those people are still not friends. And what bugs me, I, I think I saw it on the chat. I kind of missed it. But, like, I have work friends, and then I have real friends. I, I never really understood that. If you have a friend, is just a friend. There's no real. If you call someone at work a friend, they are your real friend. Well, it's interesting. We have a comment here from A Dubs 1988. I've been friends with people who directly reported to me. If you're a cool person, being a manager is a hundred times easier. And uh, uh, Dr. Hausman, you also found in your studies that the friendship aspect of work didn't just affect the, the workers, it also affected the workplace profitability. So it's something that perhaps companies should strive for or, or an environment, like a lot of our comments, commenters are talking about Google, for example, that, and also here at HuffPost Live, we have a wonderful community uh, that strives for friendships can actually be a more productive, profitable workspace. Yeah, there's no question that people who are socially connected at work, they stay longer, they're more productive. I mean, just something that Shola had mentioned before around direct reports. It's interesting because these friendships, it might be a little bit more difficult to establish a friendship with someone that's either a direct report or a manager. Uh, but at the same time, what we found is that the best managers can keep people five to six times longer than the worst. So, and we think a big piece of that equation is developing those relationships and making sure that your direct reports recognize that, that you care about them, that you're interested in their personal development. So it's a fine line that needs to be walked, but it yields huge dividends when you're talking about how much that, that engaged employee can contribute to their employer's bottom line. That is so true. Oh, oh no, Beth, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, I guess maybe I'm overly cautious because I am of the kind of oversharing generation. Facebook and Twitter kind of came about when I was in college, and people my age in their mid to late 20s uh, post too much. They post too much on Facebook, and I think sometimes that's leached over into the workplace. Um, I've seen people my age, you know, leave papers purely because they just kind of couldn't figure out how it was like they were that oversharing person on Facebook all the time, but in the office, I think it was very difficult for them to figure out how to stop being that way, I guess. Well, we have a comment here from Josh John 11 Be careful what personal things you say to a coworker. They could be used against you, but then you have people who have bosses that say inappropriate things to them or things that are perceived as inappropriate. We have Liz Pearl. I had a supervisor invite me to his church more than once. I asked him if he thinks I need to be saved. He said yes. Now, what do you do in a situation like this where the olive branch of friendship is being offered to you in a manner that doesn't necessarily jive? with who you are or who you can pretend to be. What, what is your advice in this situation where you we obviously don't want to step on your boss's toes, you don't want uh, your boss to think poorly of you, but their idea of friendship... I would step on his toes. <laughs> I, I would not be afraid to say in that instance that um, that, that is not for me and that uh, you know I would be happy to get to know them on, on different grounds. But living, I'm from the north and live in the south, and that is a thing that happens a lot. It's the uh, what's your name, what church do you go to conversation. And most people don't like, um, they don't really go into it wanting an accurate answer. They want kind of to hear what they want to say. But uh, I don't like to be confrontational, but I do believe that it's uh, that it's good to kind of stand your ground and say, you know, that's not really me. How about a cup of coffee, though? Perfect. So, so Beth, I'm, I'm curious. Is 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 the problem the small talk that that you typically have to have around the water cooler, or is it when they probe too much and they're sort of trying to get too much information out of you, and you want to make sure there's a little bit of a, a boundary there? Well, I think it's a combination of things. When I'd written that post, really, I was just feeling very kind of weighed down by the banality of all my interchanges. I felt like I hadn't had a real conversation in a really long time. Um, but also, at the same time, I'm that person at work who puts their headphones in because everybody around their desk is talking about their kids and their weekend. And, uh, you know, I run an entire magazine, just me, so, so there's a lot to do. So I've been perceived as being very antisocial because... Sometimes, especially if I'm in a groove, I just need to sit down and focus. 
Well, you've been very focused here tonight, but you've also been very friendly, and we appreciate that. We appreciate your writing, <laughs> Beth. And Dr. Hasman, we so appreciate the wonderful work that you're doing at Evolve. And Miriam, we love the work that you're doing at AOL Jobs. And Shola, we love the work that you're doing as a positivity consultant. We look forward to having your positivity back here at HuffPost Live. We have Franz77. Just staying true to you. That might be more like it in the workplace, but then he follows up and says, that being said, I haven't had a job in quite a while. So, so, so Franz, maybe hopefully this conversation has opened up your eyes if you're looking for a job. If not, keep on staying true to you and keep on watching, keep on checking out what's coming up next in our green rooms because the conversation always continues next courtesy of Cadillac.